The arguably most famous sermon to have ever been preached is found in the Gospel of Matthew, stretched out over three different chapters, Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. And if you know a little bit about who Matthew was, he was one of Jesus' disciples who was a disciple um, after being converted from a tax collector. And he wrote in great detail about what Jesus preached and why he preached it and in the way that he preached it, as well as to who Jesus preached to, especially in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, in Matthew chapter four, we see some clarity about who the Sermon on the Mount was addressed to and being people who were not considered elite. They were not considered the top of the food chain in that time and in that culture. A lot of them were sick and forgotten about and outcasts in the culture, which I think reveals something so significant about the heart of Jesus and how Jesus is passionate about every single person on planet earth. But when you look at Matthew chapter five, it begins in this kind of kingdom manifesto idea of Jesus articulating what does it look like for you and I and the people of that day to live in God's kingdom. And then in Matthew chapter six, the, the second kind of part of the sermon, you see Jesus almost like slam on the brakes and say, hey, I want you to see something really clearly. And this is what he says in Matthew 6, verse one. He says, be careful, pay, pay close, close attention, not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. Be careful, pay attention, look closely as to why you are doing what you are doing. Because if you don't pay close attention, that you run the risk of missing the reward that our Father in heaven wants to give us when we choose to have a pure heart and a good intention and a solid, solid direction. So to begin our time together today, I would love to ask you the question, why do you do what you do? And I'm not talking about your job. I'm not talking about the degree that you're trying to earn right now. I'm not talking about your identity as a parent. I'm talking about the everyday, ordinary activity of your life, the way that you respond to your spouse, that website that you look at at night, the, the things that you eat, the things that you consume, the things that you laugh at, the things that you participate in in this life. Why do you do what you do? That's the question that I would love for you to think about over the next few minutes. If we've never met before, uh, my name is Carson. I serve as the director of Overflow here at our church, which is a gathering of 18 to 25 year olds. And uh, I'm really, really excited to talk to you about some things that are in the message today because they have been consistent themes that have come up in this room on Tuesday nights over the course of the past year. But before we go any further, uh, one thing that we do very consistently at Overflow to begin the message is have you talk to each other. Uh, and some of you are like, no, don't do that. We're gonna do it anyway. Uh, so here's what I would love for you to do. Look to the person sitting beside you. Are you ready? And say, I am your friend. Everybody online, you text somebody. Everybody in Leland, you got this. This is for you too. <laughs> now look to the person that you neglected and say, I'm your friend too. Leave no man behind. I want to be your friend too. I want us to all be friends today. And friends are honest with each other. Friends are clear with each other, right? And today I want us to do a little bit of heavy lifting together over the next 31 minutes together in this place. So everybody ready to sit forward, lean in with me, and we are about to take off. A couple of weeks ago, our pastor uh, began this conversation around delight. And this is the way that he defined what we believe delight is. He said, delight is to encounter something good and allow its goodness to awaken us to what we want. And last week, if you were here, or you watched online, maybe you were out of town, uh, we identified four critical things that we believe that God has in for us as we are pursuing delight. We will not find delight on God's terms if we do not take these four things seriously. And we said this, that God's way to delight is clarity. Like we've got to have clarity about who God is and what God is like and what God is asking of you and of me. Uh, we need communion with God. We need courage and we need intentionality. And then some other kind of things that come along with those words is when we think about clarity, uh, it often feels limiting. It feels like we're getting put into a theological or ideological box that makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable 
uncomfortable, but nonetheless, God wants to be clear about who he is and what his intention for you and your life is. Communion with God oftentimes feels unattainable because we can't see God physically. It can feel like a bit of a challenge to connect with him. And then we also talked about this idea that we're gonna have to choose courage, but courage always, always coexists with fear. And then we talked about intentionality and how it takes discipline and how the word discipline is not really something that a lot of us in the room are very interested in, right? Like our culture has kind of waged a little bit of a war on the idea of discipline. And the thing that I just want you to know is just because something is hard doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. In fact, when we do the hard things, when we do the heavy lifting things, we actually grow the most. It was a primary idea of the message Last week, and we kind of landed everything together last week by saying this, the way that we see God determines our ability to experience true and lasting delight. The way that we see God is so, so important because when we see God clearly, we realize that God cares about everything that we do because everything that we do contributes to the people that we are becoming, and God cares deeply about who it is that we are and who we become along the way. I made a list of the things that we do uh, in general, kind of from a 30,000 foot view, and it started like this, is we do what we like. Like, this is pretty obvious, but like, if we like something, then we're going to probably do it. We're probably going to do it, going to do it pretty often with a certain level of vigor and ambition and passion and, and resources. A lot of our budget and a lot of our time is probably going to be centered around the things that we like the most. And then next, we do what we have energy for. If we have energy for it, we're willing to do it. But if we don't have energy for it, we're not super willing to do it. We kind of push that out of our life because simply for the reality that we, we don't feel like we have energy for it. And yes, we all have a limited amount of energy. Another thing that we do is we do what our mother-in-law thinks that we should do. Like we, 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 we all know this for all of the people that are married in the room. Like this is a good thing. Like this, this helps us. It keeps us on track. They're looking out for us every step of the way. We, we also do what we've always done. Like we, we repeat things often because it worked one time. So surely it's going to work again. If you were to ask Jake, Jen, or Anna Claire, the people on my staff team here, they would be able to tell you that like this statement gives me the chills when it's like, hey, what should we do? Well, we did this before. I'm like, well, I want to do something new. Like I, I love creating new ideas, but a lot of times we, we do what we've always done. And then lastly, like we, we always do like a lot of times what we feel like we have to a lot of times we don't feel like we get to choose the things that we do because we're a parent or we're uh, in a job that's incredibly demanding, which kind of creates this space between what we do and what is best, right? The things that we do are not always the best things. And this has been revealed to me and I, I feel this on a deep level for my life and I hear this a lot of times, especially from our college students, is a statement like this, is I should, I should do this. I should pray more. I should read my Bible more. I should exercise more. I should eat better. I should hang out with my kids more. I shouldn't work as much as I do. I should, I should, I should. Which leaves you and I feeling in this place of regret and shame day in and day out because we don't feel like we are, we're measuring up or we're hitting the mark. And we feel like what I would define as the messy middle. We feel like we find ourselves here often in between the life that you are living, the life that I am living in the life that you want. I feel like I'm constantly stuck in between this. I have a dream or I have an ambition or I have a desire for what I believe and what I yearn for my life to look like. But it seems like that's a long, long way from where I actually am. For all of you Jesus followers and Christians in the room, this is probably what the messy middle looks like when it comes to our faith is that we're in between seeing God clearly and following God fully, right? Like you think about last week, we were talking about who God is and what God is like and the, the importance of seeing God clearly. But then as it relates to the activity of our life, there can often be distance. There can be dissonance in between those two things. And the thing that I, I challenge our college students with all the time is to evaluate, are your decisions based upon what's ultimately important or immediately satisfying? I beg them to consider this. Because this, this dichotomy in between these two words has the power to drastically change the trajectory of your life. Over the past several months, I've been trying uh, to eat better and lose a little bit of weight. Notice I'm wearing all black today. It makes you look thin on stage. It's a pastor hat. Check it out. Uh, but I've been trying really, really hard to, to, to eat better. And something dawned on me the other night. And of course, I thought, 
of a, a coexisting scripture, which we'll get to that in just a second. I was sitting in my bed, minding my own business, watching my Netflix show. My, my wife was actually exercising at the time. I wasn't. Uh, and I'm like laying there, minding my own business. And then a thought pops into my mind. We have frozen ice cream Snickers bars in the freezer. <laughs> And I'm telling you, I did a full sit up, launched straight out of the bed to the kitchen, didn't have to think about it. It was not something I needed to evaluate. It was immediately important to me. Well, then the other night, I'm doing the same thing. (laughs) This says a lot about me. Uh, I'm not exercising, my wife is exercising, and I'm laying there. And my phone starts to ring, and I look to my right, and it's my sister-in-law. I pick up the phone, I'm like, hey, Mikhail. She said, I'm out front with Brit's Donuts. I'm like, I'll be right there. Like, don't go anywhere, right? Like, I didn't have to think about that. Like, I was tempted immediately. And yes, I knew that they were coming, but man, like, I was stoked. I had three. Uh, If you're you're not from Wilmington and you're vacationing here, add Brit's Donuts to your list because anybody in this room will affirm it's, it's, okay, come on. I've been talking about theology for 10 minutes and Brit's Donuts is the thing that got an amen. But the, the, difference, the, the difference between ultimate and immediate is important and it was important to Jesus and the disciples. Oh, they got this wrong so many times, just, just, just like you and I do. In Matthew 26, it's so interesting because Jesus goes away to pray and it's in the final moments before Jesus goes to the cross and the disciples decide it's a good time to lay down and to take a nap and Jesus comes back to find them sleeping and he's like, Hey, come on, guys, I left for like two minutes and I come back and you're snoozing on me. Like this is a big day. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, not fall into sin. He said, I don't want you to even fall into temptation. I don't want you to run the risk of choosing what's immediately satisfying over what's ultimately important. This matters where your attention is and the why behind what you do, it it, it matters. The spirit the Spirit's willing, Peter. The the Spirit's willing, Andrew. But but the flesh is weak. The Spirit of God is willing and is able to help guide you and to direct you in your life to a full and a free and a hope-filled life. But you must pay attention to your direction. One of my favorite quotes is by Andy Stanley. He says, direction, not intention, determines destination. A lot of us have fantastic uh, intentions, but our direction hasn't been directly influenced and we haven't changed some big things about our life. And I think what you've uncovered, the more you look at this, is that it's actually habits that inform direction. Duke University did a study of how people make decisions and they actually found that over 40% of the decisions that you and I make on a daily basis actually are coming from our subconscious habits that we have formed over the course of our life. Why does this matter? When our intentions change, but our habits don't, our direction stays the same. I like to imagine that the disciples that day with Jesus, they had the best intentions. But their their habit of taking a nap on company time was like, it costed them a little talking to by Jesus, which now you and I get to benefit from. And we get to look at it. We go, what what can we learn from this? And I think a big thing that, this is is bittersweet. Uh, It's sweet because we can do something about it. It's bitter because it, it makes us evaluate what has led us to where we are today. The life that we are living today is a result of the habits that we have formed along the way. And if I'm up in your space right now, I'm I'm really sorry, but like it's time that you and I evaluate our habits. And Paul was writing to the church uh, around Galatia and it's it's well documented and you kind of see it throughout the letter that Paul's like, come on guys, like I've I've been saying this, I've been saying this, I I need you to like kind of zone in a little bit. I need you to pay really close attention. And in chapter six, Verse seven, he says, don't be misled. Like you, you do not want to be confused about this. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. You cannot plant something and expect to get something different. You cannot have a certain kind of rhythm of habits and expect to reap a different reward. You must pay attention to what you are planting. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death 
from that sinful nature. But, but those who live to please the Spirit, ah, they, they will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Probably another way to say this would be they will, they will harvest everlasting delight from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. But there are a lot of you, even in just me mentioning the word discipline or evaluating our habits or considering why we do what we do, you're like, I'm out. Because it's hard and it's challenging. But here's what's at stake. And I think that Paul is trying to get them to understand this, is what we do habitually determines, it determines how we experience God relationally. The habits that we keep, what we do habitually determines how we experience God relationally. Every single time, the habits that you have in the morning, the habits that you have at night inform how you experience what God is trying to say and trying to do in your life. All of it matters. C.S. Lewis said this in Mere Christianity. I think it's so brilliant. But good and evil both increase at compound interest. This is what make, should make all of us like lean up just a little bit because it's, it's, it's good and it's challenging, right? The more good that we do, it's going to increase at compound interest because of what it's gonna re reap in our life. But also the same is true for evil. That is why the little decisions, the little things that we make every day are of such infinite importance. I love the way that John Ortberg, who wrote a book called Soul Keeping, describes what this tension looks like. He says, when my will is consistently, freely, and joyfully aligned with what I most deeply value, my soul finds rest. If we want to treat the summer as a Sabbath, we've got to start here, to, considering, to consider what's happening in between our soul and our values and our activity, because that is wholeness. And when I live with half-hearted devotion, my soul is always strained. This is so important because it introduces a new word. The word is devotion. We have to be devoted. We have to be focused. We have to be really, really clear, not only about why we do what we do, but what we do with our time. And that's where we landed the message last week. And we actually mentioned this briefly uh, in the course of the message last week. But in John chapter 15, Jesus pulls all of his people together and he makes something really, really clear. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Remaining and abiding and staying truly and consistently devoted to the one who made us is the only way to experience true delight. If we want to find a source of life and freedom and joy and happiness and delight, we must, we must choose to be devoted because God-given delight is always found in God-centered devotion. God-given delight is only found in God-centered devotion. And I think the, the, the word devotion in our, in our church culture, in our Christian culture, you could be, begin to think, well, I don't have a devotional or I don't have a time of devotion in my life. And I'm talking way bigger than that, way higher level than that. I'm not talking about just the five or, or 10 or 30 minutes that you spend with God every day. I'm talking about the life that you are living with God. Three words that if you're looking to increase devotion to God in your life that you need to pick up and you need to look at and, and consider our consistency, proactivity, and authenticity. You must, you must be consistent. Notice it's not perfection, but it is consistent. It, it is being really, really intentional about the activity of your life. It is being really, really intentional about the habits that you hold and the habits that you keep and the habits that you make decisions from. You must be proactive. You cannot wait until the dark skies roll in in your life and the difficult times present themselves. You must, you must be proactive at choosing to remain with God 
and allow him to be your source of everything good in your life. And you, you must be authentic. And the word authenticity and the word vulnerability kind of have like um, orbited around a lot in our culture these days. And it's become a very, very common thing that I think that we say without even realizing what does it mean and what's at stake here. And there's a book called Emotionally Healthy Discipleship by Pete Scazzaro. And anytime that I see a book with emotionally healthy on it, I'm like, dang it, that's for me. Like, I, I, I need to read that. I, and I, I read it not too long ago for the second time. And as I was reading through it, I found this graph where he describes the stages of our faith and our movement of the spiritual life. And this is what he says um, in, the, in the graph. It's like stage one is this life-changing awareness of God, where we like see God clearly and we see God's character as good and as loving and as compassionate and gracious. And then we allow that to start to move us in God's direction. And then we enter into stage two, which is discipleship, where we begin to like, really learn and pull apart some of the things in our life. And then maybe we become active in our spiritual life where we begin volunteering and we begin giving and we begin to participate in the church and in God's movement uh, in our communities. And then he suggests, and I've been talking to our college students about this very consistently, is that there's a wall in between the active life and the journey inward of, of real authenticity and vulnerability with yourself about what's happening underneath the surface of your life. And then the journey outward actually comes from your journey inward and your inward truth and reality. And then finally, the idea of like the, 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 this beautiful end to this graph is that we're transformed into love. We're transformed into God's image that he has for us. But we never get there if we're not willing to push through the wall. If we're not willing to be true and authentic with ourselves consistently, and proactively, if, if we don't do these things on the reg, I can't believe I just said that, but if we don't do these things consistently, we will reap a different form of harvest. And Paul would suggest that discipline is the way that we get past this proverbial wall that we're talking about and pursuing a true life of spirituality with Jesus in the way of Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians Chapter nine, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth and he gets super clear with them. There's lots of things happening in this city and he's got a lot to talk about. And he says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it to, to, for an eternal prize. And this idea about athletes, I think is so significant, especially during this time, because the different games that are happening in culture, um, it's widely studied and widely researched and documented that athletes would actually train naked because they did not want to have anything encumbering them from pushing their body as hard and as fast as they could because they were in it to win. And no, I am not suggesting birthday suits. That is not at all what I'm talking about, but I am talking about what does it look like for us to take away the things that the motive isn't pure for. When we think about the things that we do, that the why isn't healthy, they gotta go. Because we want to harvest something good. We want to harvest delight out of the depths of our life. We don't want to reap destruction. We don't want to fall for temptation and walk down a path of darkness and isolation in our life, a, a, a path that I would argue that we would all regret. And in verse 26, he goes on to say this. So I run, talking about himself, with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. And otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I my, myself might be disqualified. But he, he runs with purpose in every step. He disciplines his body. He takes away what he's got to in order to live fully devoted. And what we know about Paul is a lot of these times that he's writing, he's writing from a jail cell. He's writing from being by himself, which I think just opens up this beautiful reality for us to, to take note of, that true devotion is cultivated by private discipline. It, it's, it's cultivated. If we want to live a life of devotion to God, that's going to grow. That's going to be developed by private discipline. 
I, I was reading this week about Kobe Bryant and the way that he would train. And it's well known around the, the, the sports community, which I know nothing about sports. I didn't make a single sports team in my whole entire time in school. More on that later. I'm working it out with my counselor once a month. But like there, the, the, when you look at Kobe, he would train at three and four o'clock in the morning because he, he wanted to get up early and to push himself and to be really, really devoted to disciplining his mind and his body to be the best that he could be. He worked hard for it. He didn't just walk on the court and was naturally one of the most gifted basketball players to ever live. He, he worked it. He developed it. He challenged himself to grow. Private discipline needs to be something that you and I choose consistently and proactively if we're going to find this well of delight that God is offering to you and to me. So to pull all of this together, I want you to know that when, when God sends your devotion becomes a habit, delight becomes a reflex. When we choose to make God centered devotion something that is a daily habit, multiple times a day, where we are choosing to be devoted to the truth and the reality of God, that and only then is when delight becomes a reflex in our life. So how do you begin and how do I begin to develop God-centered devotion so that delight gets to become a reflex? I think the first thing that we need to do is ask ourselves the question, what do we need to break up with? I'm not talking about a who, I'm talking about a what. I'm talking about what habits do you need to break up with? Did you know that the uh, United States breakup letter to England, the Declaration of Independence, was 36 sentences long, 1,320 words, and all of a sudden, we're on our own over here. A bunch of colonies trying to get aimed in the right direction. That's so interesting to me because of how short it is. And I think that shows it doesn't take much. When you need to, to break up with an old habit, an old way of thinking, what do you do to do that? You just do it. Like I was listening to a podcast episode the other day talking about trust and how do you begin to like uh, trust your team and the guy builds it up, builds it up, builds it up. And he's like, I'm gonna tell you the secret weapon to trusting people more. You trust them. I was so mad. I was like, I finally cracked the code. There's an equation out here. But the truth is how you get rid of an unhealthy and old habit is you replace it with a good one. You replace it with the habit of being devoted to what God says and what God has for you and for me. And here's what's at stake is unhealthy habits. They actually bend. They bend our faith away from God and toward ourselves, which if you were here last week, this is where we talked about the idea of secondary delight when we get to determine what is good. And then we have to rely on it to determine or our, our, our to, to, to produce this joy and happiness in the moment and for the moment. Unhealthy habits, they gotta go. Because don't forget the statistic by Duke, 40% of our decisions come from our subconscious habits that we have picked up along the way. Which brings us to the second question. It's what do you need to begin? What do you need to start in your life? In the book of Zechariah, towards the end of our Old Testament, we see the story are part of the story of the people coming out of, or people of Israel coming out of exile, moving back into Jerusalem and kind of setting up shop once again after being in exile for a really long time. And Zechariah and Haggai are responsible for kind of like pulling the people together and getting them really, really focused on setting their eyes and their attention and their heart back on God and back on what God has for them. And part of that process is the rebuilding of the temple. And over the course of the book of Zechariah, you actually see he has eight different dreams that are all symmetrical. It's super fascinating the way that they all kind of interwork together. But in the eighth one, in Zechariah 4, um, he's talking about what he's hearing from God about the building of the temple. And this is what he says. He says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin in reference to the rebuilding of the temple, a, a dwelling place for God's presence here on earth to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. If you're looking for a name for your kid, here's a great one. But notice that, that, that I love this translation, the New Living Translation in this, to see the plumb line. That's the very beginning of the project. It's, it's ground level. 
It's getting everything formed to build a new foundation. And what's he saying that God is saying to him about that phase of the project? That God delights in that. He rejoices to see the work begin. And a lot of us, we're like, oh, well, if I can't start and be perfect at something, then it's not worth doing. Zechariah is saying, God rejoices in the small, humble, seemingly insignificant beginnings. Why? Because good and evil, they operate on compound interest. The more that we stay in devotion to and with God, the more of a harvest we get to reap from God dwelling in our everyday, ordinary moments of life. And then God begins to change the why behind all the things that we do. So to make it really practical, that's, this is the card that you got on the way in, the habit of delight experience. There's eight different practices if you go to that link on the website that we believe will help you begin to experience delight in your everyday ordinary life. And, and here's the tension. You're gonna open up the document. You're gonna go, all right, I need a strategy on how to do all eight. No. <laughs> Why? Because God rejoices in the small beginnings. Pick one that you can apply to your life today. Pick one that you can choose to, to practice while you're on vacation and in the future. Pick one that you can just apply to Monday morning or Tuesday morning along the way. And I recently read a book called Atomic Habits by a guy named James Clear. And he says something towards uh, the middle of the book that I just find so, so helpful and so encouraging to a perfectionist like me. He says, habits are behaviors that we repeat consistently. However, they are not behaviors that we repeat perfectly. This small idea that consistency does not require perfection is important. I think this is so important for you to hear, for everyone in Leland to hear, for all of you watching online to hear, and for me to hear. That perfection can't be the goal because you will fail every single time. Trust God with the outcome. Just obey him along the way. So Matthew 6, verse 1, as we began, Jesus says, be really careful not to practice your righteousness, your rightly related nature to me or to God in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then throughout the middle section of chapter 6, he teaches um, them how to pray and what does it look like to like store your treasures in heaven in the right place and, and all these different big ideas of the kingdom begin to get fleshed out in the middle of chapter six. But towards the very end, he says something that we should all write on the forefront of our minds and embed into our heart. In verse 30, 33, he says, but seek first his kingdom, not, not our kingdom. We have to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In other words, when you seek first God's kingdom, and you devote your life to him, you're going to experience a peace, and a freedom, and a delight that is so far beyond our world's imagination, so, be, so far beyond our current imagination, which is why when Paul was writing to the church in Galatia, he ended that section with don't give up. No matter how far away it feels, God says that he wants to dwell with us. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for the truth of your son. We thank you for the clarity that Paul gives us through his letters to the church in Galatia and Corinth. God, I thank you for our church and how we are all just seeking to rest in your goodness and rest in your provision. I pray that we would. I pray that we would have the courage and the discipline to live devoted lives, to reap a harvest 
that only you can produce. God, we love you and we say this in the name of Jesus.